Our next three presenters will be Jean Ruff, Clay Calloway, and Lauren Dupre. To begin, Jean obtained a bachelor's in nursing from the University of New Mexico and worked in trauma surgical specialty for four years before returning to school to focus on public health. She holds a master's in public health and a master's in nursing from the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and worked as a research coordinator at a tropical medicine lab during school. Her current position is a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer stationed at the Southern Nevada Health District in Las Vegas, Nevada. Next, Clay Calloway is a Senior Environmental Health Specialist in the Environmental Related Illness Program at Maricopa County Environmental Services. Clay has worked in the ERI program since 2018 and is responsible for conducting case investigations, local and multi-state outbreak response, and traceback. When he isn't out in the field, he conducts complaint surveillance for food and waterborne illness in Maricopa County, teaches the county's active managerial control class, and trains new environmental health specialists. Lastly, Lauren DePritt has an MPH and REHS and is a senior environmental health specialist at the Southern Nevada Health District. She is responsible for coordinating the environmental health response in foodborne illness outbreaks. In between outbreaks, she is the principal investigator on CDC EHS net funded research exploring food safety culture. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today and thank you for that nice introduction. Over the past months, we've been working on a multi-jurisdictional response involving an outbreak of non-viral hepatitis that has been linked to a brand of bottled alkaline water. Both epidemiology and environmental health investigations have been critical to this effort. Today, I'm going to give a brief overview of the epidemiology investigation, and then Lauren Dupreet from the Southern Nevada Health District and Clay Calloway from Maricopa County will describe those environmental health investigations in more detail. In November of 2020, five children under the age of five were hospitalized after vomiting for several days. Upon admission, they were found to be in acute liver failure and were transferred to a hospital in Utah for possible treatment. They had extensive workups, but no cause was identified. All recovered and were discharged home within about two weeks. A physician in Utah reported this unusual cluster to health authorities in Nevada. I interviewed the families and found that other household members experienced vomiting within the same time frame, and one adult was actually hospitalized with unexplained liver failure in August of 2020. All patients and symptomatic household members consumed the same brand of bottled water prior to illness onset. Real water, alkaline water, which was produced regionally and available nationwide. There are a number of challenges identified from the very beginning. First of all, hepatitis of unknown cause is, by definition, a diagnosis of exclusion. And we needed help from subject matter experts to determine exactly what health outcome we were looking for. There's no diagnostic code specific for hepatitis of unknown cause and no existing public health surveillance system. So we didn't know how often it occurs normally or whether there was an increase above that baseline. And it wasn't clear why real water seemed to be associated with the illnesses. We didn't know what about the water could be making people sick. And then finally, since the project, product was widely distributed, we knew we might have a multi-state outbreak and would need federal assistance for that reason as well. So the case definition is, is fairly complicated, but bear with me. All cases must have visited a healthcare provider and had clinical evidence of severe new onset hepatitis with no documented cause. Onset had to be on or after August 1st, 2020, following the use of real water during the preceding 30 days. Since there's no diagnostic code for hepatitis of unknown cause, we had to create a case definition based on lab results such as liver function tests and multiple tests for specific causes of hepatitis. This required a really extensive review of the medical records in order to, to determine uh, whether illnesses actually met the case definition. So for this reason, and because the case definition required um, extensive testing with multiple negative test results, we were only able to count cases on the severe end of the potential spectrum of illness. There just was no way we would be able to determine whether um, 
people reporting only vomiting uh, were actually due to this uh, exposure. In addition to meeting the lab criteria related to liver function tests and having no specific cause for hepatitis listed in the medical records, probable cases had to have documentation of negative viral hepatitis tests, including viral hepatitis A, B, and C. And they also had to have hepatic imaging that did not reveal a cause. So either a CT or an MRI of the liver, for example. If either of those two things were missing, but the rest of the criteria was met, we designated the case as suspect case. We relied very heavily on self-report for this outbreak and also on clinician reports. So we communicated with the public um, via public web postings, which were then taken up by, um, by media. And the Southern Nevada Health District put up an online self-reporting survey, which allowed people to self-report to us. And then we could screen those reports for further follow-up. We did also receive several reports from out-of-state residents and were able to pass that information on to the appropriate jurisdictions. Um, FDA also collected some self-reports through their MedWatch program and their consumer complaint program. And so those were funneled to the appropriate jurisdictions as well. To get the word out to clinicians and health departments, we um, uh, released an FEX and a national health alert network, uh, health alert, uh, AHAN, uh, and these were then taken up by local jurisdictions and amplified. We got about, uh, actually over a hundred self-reports of illnesses that people believed could be related to this outbreak. Um, and we got a handful of clinician reports as well. Again, we were only able to count cases on the most severe spectrum of illness. So our total case count is 21 probable cases and four suspect cases. As you can see, most of them were Nevada residents, although we do have three probable cases who were California residents. All cases besides the initial five children were adults older than 30 years old. One probable case did result in a death, and this was a woman in her 60s with underlying medical conditions, and she died of complications during hospitalization. And that was in November of 2020. As you can see, there were some cases in the late summer and early fall, but there's a pretty clear peak in November. And I think it's important to note that um, the, the onset of August 2020 was um, included in the case definition. So we only included cases with onset after that date, after the 1st of August. And the reason we did this was because we had, the only way we could measure the exposure was through self-report. And we were concerned about getting accurate information if we asked people to try to recall how much water they had consumed too long ago. We did have a few self-reports prior to August 1st, 2020, but the preliminary information indicated that the vast majority of cases occurred afterwards. And then you can see we didn't have anybody with um, onset in December. We did receive a few self-reports in early of 2020 early 2021, but none of those self-reports met the case definition. Common symptoms included fatigue, nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite. And these are symptoms that you would expect to see among people with liver disease. Uh, we also had quite a few people reporting dizziness, which is an interesting finding, but the word dizziness can actually be used to describe a variety of sensations and each of these can be caused by several different things. So it's interesting, but it's not that helpful of a finding. We wanted to search for possible cases in population data sets to try to help understand how big of an outbreak this was. We worked with CDC's Natu National Syndromic Surveillance Program, um, Arizona Department of Health, Maricopa County, to develop a query to do this. And as you can see, the fact that hepatitis of unknown cause is a diagnosis of exclusion is clearly reflected in this very long list of exclusion criteria in gray. We tried this query on several different data sets and we didn't find anything 
um, too interesting in, as far as trends go in most of them. Um, but we were able to find an interesting trend when we applied it to hospital discharge data from Clark County, which is of course the county where uh, Las Vegas is located. So this is that trend. And as you can see, we um, typically average around 15 um, hospitalizations per month, more or less, and we have for several years. Uh, and then starting in October and November, 2020, um, we have uh, an increase above that baseline. So 29 hospitalizations in October and 33 in November of 2020. We did uh, try to see how sensitive this uh, query was by checking for the probable cases in the query output. And out of the 18 probable cases from Nevada who could have been identified, we were successful in identifying 14. So. We know this query does a pretty decent job of finding what we were hoping to, to find. We still have a lot of unanswered questions though. For example, what substance actually caused the illnesses? Clinical findings suggest a possible toxic or chemical exposure, but laboratory analyses of real water samples have unfortunately been unrevealing. Nonetheless, the firm has recalled all products and has signed a consent decree with FDA, which prevents them from operating until certain provisions are met. We also want to know why some people got so sick while others in their household did not. We conducted detailed interviews of cases and their household members and are working on analyzing this data to try to identify any characteristics that were associated with more severe illness. This has really taken an extensive team, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone from SNHD, CDC's National Center for Environmental Health, and ATSDR, who have been leading um, this investigation from CDC's perspective. Um, many branches of FDA, um, Nevada Department of Health and Human Services, Arizona Department of Health Services, Maricopa and Pima County, Utah Department of Health, California Department of Health, and of course, the hospital and clinicians that have reported cases to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and get started talking about the EH side of the investigation um, in Southern Nevada. Okay, I'm sure someone will stop me if you can't hear me or see this. Uh, my name is Lauren Dupreet. I run the environmental health response for foodborne illness outbreaks. Um, and this was a big one for us, right? So Jeannie did a great job of explaining the epi complications and how those were worked through. And then it came over to us to see what we could find out. Um, and first, I just wanted to lay the context a little bit, give you some background information. So this is the recipe for real water. They start with tap water. They use the municipal water that comes in from the city. They send it through filtration and RO. Then it goes to a big mixing tank where they add their E2 concentrate, which is a proprietary formula. And then they bottle everything and they create five gallon bottles, smaller retail size. And then they also sell the E2 concentrate itself for folks to dilute as they go into whatever water they have. And we did see cases report exposure to the finished real water product as well as the E2 concentrate. So those were both of interest to us. And then here is a little layout of the operations of real water. This took us a minute to piece together, um, but really you can see the, the breadth of the distribution here. Um, in Nevada is where they did their five gallon bottling. They also had home delivery service for folks out here with those five gallon bottles. And as best we can tell, they were producing that E2 concentrate here as well. In Arizona, they were bottling the retail sizes. So the smaller ones that you would get at the market or at a convenience store. Um, and they used to have home delivery there of five gallon bottles that they had recently ended 
by the time we got there for the investigation. In Utah, they had licensees who made the water from concentrate. Same thing in California. California, they also had home delivery where they took the five gallon bottles from Vegas and delivered them to homes in Southern California. And then they had a co-packer in Tennessee making real water. And then on top of this, they had retail sales. You could buy it off their website. You could uh, buy it off of Amazon. So it was pretty accessible. And um, of course, an out or a response of this size takes uh, a high level of communication. I really want to focus kind of on our strategy here. Uh, so especially because this is the first time that I had ever worked on a multi-agency response of this size, um, certainly ever worked on it this closely. So I wanted to share with you a few lessons learned and kind of how it all worked together. So of course, you know, we had federal agency support. We needed it for sure. Um, FDA provided boots on the ground for the EH investigation. They went into the bottling plant with us and led the investigation, collected samples, handled all of the testing. They also had a veterinary team that helped us with the uh, pet illnesses and pet deaths. And uh, they ran the recall and the enforcement actions through the courts. CDC, you've already heard a little bit about what they've done. They sent more staff on the ground for us here in Las Vegas for the EPI investigation team. They had the med talks expertise, um, and of course they helped with the case definition and surveillance. And um, one of the lessons learned in the information sharing is that they take it really seriously, which um, of course is quite evident, um, but they do require the 2088 agreement um, and or FDA commissioning. Um, and that's what allows them to share non-public information with folks outside of the FDA. But uh, I realized quite quickly that even with those in place, that they're not allowed to share as much information as I expected. So that was uh, maybe an assumption on my part. We were, you know, there were times where we'd both be standing in the bottling plant, doing the investigation together, asking questions of the operator. Um, their FDA is asking for records from the operator. Operator says, yep, I'll email them to you. I assumed that they would get forwarded to me since it was kind of a joint investigation, uh, but that was not the case. Once it was in FDA's hands, um, they have strict protocols. So uh, if you're ever in that situation, just ask the operator directly. Um, and then also we organized designated points of contact, which was really helpful in information sharing, especially the leads for each team. Um, and then FDA has an email address that's a generic core response team, whatever, at FDA, which is really helpful. Then you know you're getting the information to the folks who need it. Um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, misspelling someone's last name. And then we had these tactics calls, which I thought were really interesting. Uh, I think they started out twice a week, then once a week, and then every other week from there. But on these calls, we had so many people. We had all of the agencies involved, the states and locals, and then within those agencies, all of the departments that are involved. So EPI, EH, lab, legal, talks, hepatic experts, vets, uh, the PIO team, everyone coming together. And we had a strict agenda where we would um, each team would share their findings and their updates, and then the other teams could ask relevant questions that informed their next steps. And then as a whole, we were organizing where we were going next. And it was great for coordinating the public messaging as well. Oftentimes, you know, CDC would be asking SNHD, are you updating your website today or tomorrow? We'll do the same. They wanted to make sure that uh, they were pushing um, a cohesive message to the public. And in these calls, I was really impressed at um, how, how structured they were. They were. So at the beginning, there's a, a announcement that, um, sorry, I'm sure that's just a delivery. <laughs> there's an announcement that if you don't have your information sharing agreements in place, you have to drop off the line. And there's a pause where they're waiting for folks to, to drop off the line before they get started. And then from there, there's a strict agenda. And anytime that, like a brain, like a conversation started to happen, um, they would be, there would be someone who would pop up and say, this is a great conversation. I'd love to schedule a separate meeting for it. And that was really helpful in getting us through the agendas and making everything really efficient for us. And then as far as intra-agency communication, um, we had a shared document at SNHD where the team members could jump onto the shared doc and it was basically like a journal entry. We'd put the date and we'd put the findings from our side, right? So we would talk about what we found out or um, you know, what's coming up, our next steps. And then all the information was in one document and it got real long, right? 
Um, but that was accessible to Epi and EH and everyone involved as well as management. So they could all pop in and review as needed when needed. Um, and that helped keep our information organized. We didn't have competing email chains going back and forth and forgetting to add someone and resending and then an accidental reply all. Um, it kept it all very organized. And then on top of that shared doc, we had routine briefings where we could pull everyone together and just give them the high level updates of here's what we found, here's our next steps, here's what's coming up that we need to keep an eye on. And that helped us pr stay pretty well on the same page. So now the investigation for environmental health. And I am going to talk more about approach and less about findings in this um, because I, I still think that's really interesting, but I, I'm pretty sure you'll get the gist of what we discovered out there. So. The first visit um, was a joint visit, FDA and SNHD. Of course, we arrive unannounced. And on that first visit, we surveyed the facility, hosted a conference call with Real Water's ownership and FDA, notifying them of the outbreak and starting the investigation, asking some questions. And then there were ongoing visits for the next few weeks where we were returning to the site, taking a look at protocols, trying to review their records, interviewing different staff and just trying to get an, a feel for the operations, the flow, the food safety culture at Real Water. So here's a look at the timeline. I did start it a, a, a bit further back. So it starts here on February 16th. That's when their permit was approved after a relocation. So on February 16th, they're, they passed their plan review, but they were approved with the stipulations that they could not operate until they sent their water quality tests and we didn't hear from them until we showed up a month later at the beginning of the investigation. That was our first site visit. And at that time, even though we had not received any water quality tests, we did see them producing water. So we halted production, suspended their permit, and they agreed to a voluntary recall on that first visit. We returned the next day as scheduled. FDA collected water samples and uh, SNHD was kind of looking around and Christine Silvis was like watching the flow of the water and you could see where the water came in. It went through the filters and then it left the filters and went to the mixing tank, except for an extra water line came from the filters. And instead of going to the mixing tank, went up the wall, across the roof and through the wall next door. So we asked about that, what's next door? Oh, we don't know, we can't answer any questions. It has to go through the attorney. Um, so that piqued our interest, certainly. We returned the next day as scheduled and were denied access. Somebody came out and told us that nobody would be unlocking the door for us. Nobody would be meeting us out there that day. And they continued to deny access until the 26th when Real Water's attorneys and FDA's attorneys got on the same page. And on that visit, we got back inside. We also got access to the neighboring suite, which um, was storing evidence that looked like uh, they could be producing water in that suite as well. So we cease and desisted that, um, any use of the unpermitted suite. And um, it took a little bit more time, but then on April 7th, we returned to deliver our investigation form that summarized our risk factors. So we used the same foodborne illness form that we use for our regular food inspections that are usually for one site visit for two or three sick people at a restaurant. Um, we use that same form here. We just compiled all of the findings from the last few weeks, put it on this form. Um, it included, you know, the unpermitted issues, um, some sanitization concerns, record keeping concerns, that sort of thing. Um, and then at that time, we officially placed all product on hold, which is our version of an embargo to make sure that none of it moved. Even though we didn't plan on returning to the bottling plant, we wanted to make sure that the water didn't disappear. But even though that we were done at the bottling plant, that did not mean we were done with the environmental health investigation on this side. We did reach out to some external agencies. So of course, since we were concerned about water, we checked with the source of the water, which is the Southern Nevada Water Authority and the city of Henderson. And they confirmed through various water quality reports at different distribution points and different treatment points that there was no source issue in the water, which was to be expected, otherwise we, probably would have seen a citywide outbreak, which thankfully we did not see. So we were able to rule out um, the source municipal water. Also, what was really helpful here that I didn't know was a thing, but you can 
uh, ask for water consumption records. And the water authority in the city were great in providing those for us. And that helped us clear up when production started where. So because they were using the municipal water, it was very clear in the water consumption records that building that they were in had a very steady water consumption um, in the months preceding. And then as soon as they started operating at that new facility, it skyrocketed. And you can see exactly when they started operating. So that helped us confirm where we didn't have to rely on, um, on varying interview answers. And then at the recommendation of Adam Kramer at CDC, we reached out to our local Nevada OSHA, who was also really helpful. They have incredible records. We did a records request there and we re reviewed a lot of content. Um, what was helpful to us was the history of violations. We could see what OSHA, OSHA had previously observed and then compare that to what we were seeing currently. Uh, they also had a list of chemicals that they had seen in the past. So we uh, took those lists of chemicals, shared that with the MedTox team so that they could use that in their hypothesis generation, generating. You know, maybe we didn't see that exact chemical that day, but it has been on site in the past, something to look into. And then we spent a lot of time on the Sec Secretary of State website. There were multiple LLCs for Real Water where they kind of rotated through the family members as ownership. Um, so we spent a lot of time here because it was important to identify the responsible parties for what we were looking at. And then I'll touch on the lab. Of course, this is not my area of expertise, but just a quick summary here. Um, FDA collected tons of samples of real water and concentrate in all different sizes. And the samples came from the bottling plant itself, where um, a third party warehouse, uh, retail before it was pulled from the shelves and from case households as well. And those were all tested. And of course, you can't just hand it to the lab and say, what's in this? What's making people sick? Um, and what was really tricky was trying to identify what to test for based on the severity of the liver injury, but something that could cause that much damage without being caustic, right? Um, so, you know, of course, the experts here had all of the ingredients that went into the, the water from their recipe, as well as the chemicals that were observed on, on site. So that helped generate some ideas and prompt some tests. And as far as I know, those are ongoing um, and we'll see what comes out of it. And then enforcement actions, again, not my area of expertise, but I can give you the big stuff here. So of course we suspended their permit and placed their product on hold, which is our version of an embargo. And then FDA worked through the, cart, the courts and they entered a consent decree of permanent injunction. And if you're interested, you could just Google FDA real water consent decree and you can see it's here at justice.gov. I've just got a little screenshot here. And uh, this is the order to stop distribution. And it also has a list of the requirements that real water would have to meet before they're allowed to operate again. And it's signed by both FDA, the jet, well, by FDA, the judge and real water. And my understanding is real water signature is not an admission of guilt, but an agreement to the terms in the consent decree. So as far as the outbreak as a whole, we were able to identify the outbreak, got the case definition down, got some case finding in, identified the source, halted production, removed product from sale. These are all really big things, which is what I remind myself um, when it may feel a little dissatisfying that we don't have that final check or that box checked yet, but hopefully we will before the end of all of this. Um, and with that, I just wanted to also send a special thanks to all of the experts that we got to work so closely with. This is a great learning opportunity and um, you know, an honor to create such a big impact, especially with something that was causing such severe illness. Um, it was quite unusual. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Clay to share what was found over in Arizona. Um, my name is Clay Calloway. Um, I work in Maricopa County Environmental Services, um, and I'm part of the Environmental Related Illness Team. Um, so I do um, outbreak investigations, um, case investigations, uh, things like that. I know that Dave talked about this a little bit earlier today, but um, Environmental Services over at Maricopa County, um, they have their hand in, in multiple areas of environmental health, um, food, water, uh, waste disposal and vector-borne disease control. So while all of this was happening in Nevada, 
um, with these cases of acute non-viral hepatitis. Um, we also found out that we were um, touched by this outbreak as well. Um, the first time that uh, we found out about this situation uh, was on March 16th, um, and that was through an FDA alert. And that alert pointed to several of these cases going on in Nevada, um, and it instructed uh, the public to not drink, uh, cook with, or serve products uh, from this suspected firm. Um, but what was interesting to us is at the bottom of this alert, um, it uh, disclosed that the firm, uh, Real Water, uh, was actually headquartered in Mesa, Arizona. So after reaching out to our permitting services program, um, we discovered that the firm was um, still in plan review. So they were in the process of getting an, uh, a permit, um, but they did not have approval to operate or to do any production. Um, and as you can see in the photo, this is a photo I took on site here. Um, the firm had occupied um, several suites in what used to be a shopping center. Um, so um, I know that they've talked previously about kind of the difficulty with the suites and seeing, all right, how, how large is this operation? Um, and we had similar concerns as well. Um, unsuccessful attempts at entry. So we had quite a few of these. Um, this was uh, rather difficult in, in that regard. Um, on March 19th, um, myself, uh, a plan review inspector, and uh, two FDA investigators um, attempted to enter the facility. And um, this was kind of uh, the interesting part about uh, my entire presentation is that um, Maricopa County never had any cases. Um, so all of these acute non-viral hepatitis cases were based out of Nevada and California. Um, so my goal going into this um, was to, to determine if the firm was operating without approval and really to assess the FDA's investigation um, in any way that we could. This initial visit on the 19th, um, there were not employees from the firm that were present. Um, um, no one would answer the door and all of the windows were obstructed. So you couldn't actually see inside um, all but one. So this one uh, photo here on this slide um, it was the only shot that I could get inside the facility. Um, and you can see a few things in this slide. You can see some bottling equipment over on the left that's being stored, um, a few washers. Um, and then on the right here, just some uh, cardboard boxes that you would presume is, are full of uh, materials needed for uh, production. Um, after we realized we were not going to be able to access the facility that day, um, I took a trip around the back and looked at the dumpsters. And um, inside the dumpsters, there were several bags of water softeners, um, several empty cardboard boxes of these uh, production materials. Um, and then uh, there were actually kind of spread across the ground um, in the loading dock area were uh, plastic collars that they would use on the bottle caps. So these kind of were, were everywhere. Um, so while we couldn't get into the facility on the 19th, um, there were several things that were hinting at the possibility of production uh, without approval. Uh, and uh, throughout this investigation, we actually had two more unsuccessful attempts at entry. Um, one on the 23rd, where uh, we were actually referred to speak with the firm's attorneys uh, by the production manager, and then one more unsuccessful attempt at entry took place on the 26th. So it was really hard to get in here. It was hard to get answers throughout this investigation. Um, moving forward, um, so after that initial um, unsuccessful attempt on the 19th, um, the FDA was able to gain access. They had a solo visit out there at the, uh, at the firm on March 22nd, and they discovered that there was some finished product available on site. Um, so samples of this product were being sent off um, and an FDA inspection or what's called a 483 um, was initiated. And remember that all of this is happening while um, Nevada's situation is happening so this is kind of spreading out as we speak here. <clears throat> so the next time that we could actually get access to the facility wasn't until March 29th. And this was a joint visit with the Environmental Related Illness Program, so myself and the FDA. And it was, it was this visit on the 29th where we could really see the full scope of what was going on. 
um, what exactly was happening on site. Um, and in that, uh, that process, asking the firm questions, um, we discovered that they'd actually been in production without approval um, since September of 2020. So what is that, six or seven months of production uh, without approval? Um, and after we learned that, um, all of the product that was on site uh, was put under embargo, um, which ended up being over 100,000 pounds of bottled water. Um, despite being in production, um, a lot of the facility looked like it was still under construction. Um, there were tools spread out across the production floor. Uh, there were really entire areas of the facility that were being used just to store a kind of random um, unnecessary items. I think in the top right-hand corner of this photo, you can see some mattresses stacked up there, um, but I'll show you some other shots of, of where that's occurring as well. Here's a, one of the photos of the operation itself. Um, <clears throat> on the left, we can see the edge of one of these, uh, they call them clean rooms. And this is where the water would actually be put into bottles and capped. Um, so we can see the edge of one of the clean rooms here. Um, in the middle of this photo, you can see a storage tank um, that's filled, filled up, ready to use. And um, here through this hallway on the right, you can see more just kind of junk piled up, um, unnecessary items. Um, here is a shot of the reverse osmosis system that they were using. Um, and just to go over once more what that process looked like, um, this firm was using city water. Um, they would run that through the RO system. Um, and then after that, that RO water would be added to a chemical concentrate um, that would make the product um, alkaline. Um, here is a photo of all of the uh, chemical concentrate that was uh, present on site. Um, and this was a little strange in that the workers on site were not able to provide any details of what was inside this concentrate. Um, even though it was being added as an ingredient to the product, um, we would ask them, hey, what's in this? And they'd say, we don't know. And we would ask, all right, where's the paperwork related to this product? And they'd say, well, we don't have it. Um, so all of this concentrate that you see here, which is all that they had on site, was embargoed as well, as long, uh, as well um, in addition to all of that bottled water. Um, <clears throat> and I should mention here um, that the firm was selling this concentrate um, directly to the consumers on their website. Um, I, I would assume that the product is um, it's intended to be added by hand by the consumer. So if you had a water bottle or a glass of water, um, you could presumably add as many drops of the alkaline concentrate as you want. Um, that, uh, that product was actually being reportioned in one of the employee's offices uh, directly from bulk supply. So not in a clean room, not in any controlled environment. Um, here's a photo of some more of the product um, with just some random items on top. As I said, um, the facility was rather cluttered. Um, and then these last photos here um, show you and kind of give you an idea of how much product really ended up being embargoed. Um, typically, a firm would keep their own lot documentation um, and they'd be able to pull up exactly what was produced. Um, how much, where it was delivered, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately for us, um, that documentation was not kept by this firm at this location. Um, so that was something that we had to collect. Um, and um, the case information or the, the lot information was not on an individual case. Um, you can see pallets here stacked up with cases. Um, so what we had to do was open up every case on site take a look at the individual bottles themselves, um, record the lot code, and then restack these cases on a new pallet. So lots of um, labor. I think this process took three full days to complete. It was myself and two other FDA investigators. Um, we just put some gloves on, got a box cutter, and really went to work nonstop. Um, the, it's not uncommon for one of these pallets to have 48 cases on there. So you can kind of get an idea of how much work that would have been. Um, and after we completed the lot documentation, uh, we realized that we were looking at a um, product that was produced at the facility from December of 2020 um, to March of 2021. 
Um, and these were a combination of one gallons, 1.5 liters, one liters, and uh, 500 milliliter bottles um, that were about to be sent off for um, distribution. Uh, on April 2nd, um, we filed a non-compliance inspection report, um, and I hand-delivered that to the facility, um, essentially for operating without approval. Uh, remember, those six or seven months of production were never supposed to happen. Um, they had never actually achieved approval to operate. Um, and then on April 6th, um, I went out and um, gave the cease and desist order um, to the firm. Um, and then posted the establishment closed. So there's my photo of the, the red sign um, hanging up on the, on the front door there. The following day, um, the FDA closed out their inspection at the, the facility. Um, in addition to lot documentation, um, they gathered as much information as they could um, regarding the ingredients, um, the policies, the procedures that they had on site. Um, and I should note here too that um, Throughout our, our talks with the firm, uh, they told us that they didn't even have a HACCP plan in place for production. So lots of hurdles that we had to overcome in that regard, lots of questions that ended up generating more questions. Um, as of today, um, the firm is still closed. I know that the, the previous two presenters spoke to that. Um, and uh, all of this firm's product has been deemed adulterated. Um, and that decision was made um, after the United States Department of Justice uh, filed a complaint against the firm um, stating that they violated the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Um, so all of that product that you saw, it still remains under embargo, um, awaiting eventual destruction. Um, and that space that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation of the what used to be a shopping center, um, there is now a for lease sign posted there, so it doesn't look like the firm has any intention of staying there. Um, as it stands, um, going through all of those cases that piled up in Nevada and California, um, this is a pretty, a pretty nasty outbreak. Um, and um, I was, uh, I considered myself fortunate, even though I had to do a lot of manual labor, essentially. Um, but in, in many ways, my portion of this, uh, this environmental health response was a lot easier um, than it was in Nevada. They had to do a lot of work where here it was a very simple, you don't have any cases, let's find out if they're um, in production without approval. So um, I definitely felt for all of our partners in Nevada throughout this one, uh, this was a, a pretty tough one. And I think that uh, this serves as a powerful reminder of um, what can happen when our food and water is produced um, without proper safeguards um, and um, without proper regulations in place.